Do we have people waiting? Yes. Good. I'm admitting them now. Outstanding. Hey, good morning, Dave. Good afternoon, rather. Yeah. Can you hear me? John, are you there? Yeah. Hi, how are you? Hi. Glad to Welcome. see you. Yeah, it's good to have you. Let's see, Helen, good Hello. Oh, she's connecting to audio. All righty. Hi, Isabel. Hi, Helen. You can hear me? Some of them might be muted. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. I'm sorry I'm late, but uh, I'm here now. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I'm glad you Thank you. Us today. Thank you. And that's to all of you, of course. Yeah, I'm still taking attendance and admitting people, so I'll, I'll give my little commercial before we start it. Oh, it's 127 already. Yeah. yeah, got a few minutes. Whoever said they were late was not late. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> So got a couple of minutes, so take your time a longer because people are still joining. Sure. Hello, welcome. Maureen? Yes. Um, if, um, if, if I wanted to make a donation to the foundation, um, what is the address that I use? Are you going to mail it? Yes. Okay. The address is um, 1400. Do you have a pen? Yes. 1400 North Monroe. Okay. And that's 32303. Okay. Make it out, out to the Tallahassee Senior Foundation. Yeah, Tallahassee Seniors, uh, TSCF, Tallahassee Senior Center Foundation. Thank you so much. Well, thank, you, thank you for all the programs that you've had. Maureen? Yes. I signed up through the foundation for the Florida uh, Zoom class. 
Yes. Uh, well, I get com I never got a confirmation. I don't send that out until the, the day before the class, but you're on there. I, I saw your registration. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm still got people joining. That's fine. Okay. Hi, Maureen. Hi, Tom. Hi. Any hi. Of you? <laughs> Can't hi, see you, but hi. Hello to all of you. Hi. Thank you for. Hi, Maureen. I would say normally thank you for coming, but actually you're not coming. You're just being on air or whatever. Well, they're joining oh. us. Thank you joining. for joining hey. us. Yeah. We don't know whether oh, we're oh. coming or going. <laughs> they're attending. They're we're attending. joining us. We're all joining together. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, move into my commercial now so that Tom can get started. Uh, we appreciate any donations to the foundation. We are um, operating on a very limited um, revenue right now. We get revenue only uh, from our, you know, class donations, our sponsors and our, um, and our membership. Right now, a lot of the sponsors are hurting. Um, we're not having classes where we're paying, so we don't have that revenue. So the only revenue we're really getting right now is from um, you know, uh, individual donations and from people renewing their membership. So if you have the means and you're enjoying some of our online classes, please, um, you know, make a donation. You can either mail the check to the Senior Center at 1400 North Monroe, or you can go right on the website and make a, a donation with your credit card. Either way, we will take any way you can, and we really appreciate it. We're working hard. We've got lots of classes. We've got um, exercise classes now every day, fitness classes. We've got um, all kinds of, um, you know, we've got several lifelong learning. I've got two more coming up. The two that are coming up in June, the uh, class on uh, Mars, the planet Mars, and the class on Florida history. Those are both coming up in June, and they are both, you register online on the uh, Tallahassee Senior Center, found, oh, Tallahassee Senior Foundation website, TallahasseeSeniorFoundation.org. If you have trouble doing that, send me an email and I can help you out with the registration. But a lot of people have registered. It looks like it's going really well. Um, so please uh, look at those, look at some of our fitness and art classes. We have some great art classes too. And I wanna thank our lifelong learning sponsor, uh, Mulligan Park Senior Living. They, given us a donation earlier in the year for uh, to sponsor the lifelong learning classes and we really appreciate that. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Tom and he's going to continue on with this really fascinating class. I'm enjoying it too on uh, China. So I'm going to make you the host and if anybody else tries to join Tom, please let them in, okay? And then I'll try to do that. All right, so let's see. All right, first of all, you should, you should- Wait, just a second. Okay. okay, now you're the host. <laughs> you also see a screen in front of you that says China Now, China Crucified? Is that, you got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is probably the saddest class of any of the ones that I'm going to present in this series because in, in a couple of slides you'll see why. So, so let's just start. This is the end of the Qing Dynasty through to several years into of China and someone needs to turn their sound off there. Well, I'll do it for them. Let's see, anybody else needs to be muted? Excuse me, I'm just going to mute a few people here to make sure that we get quiet. Okay, can you all hear me? Yes? Okay. Got to get the cursor over to the right side. All right, the first half of the 20th century in China is what we're talking about today. 1895 to 1916, you have uh, the commander of the Northern Army, which included the Beijing area, uh, Yuan uh, Shaoqi. He was, uh, hold on, I gotta let two in. Oops, there we go, I think. All right. Uh, he dominated the end of the Qing government and into the beginning of what would be considered the Republic. He died in 1916 and the military commanders among themselves carved China up into what we know as the warlord. Uh, era. It was also dominated a lot by foreign powers who control the coast. I'll show you that later. Chiang Kai-shek is going to emerge in the late 1920s. He's one of the warlords. He becomes the head of the country and imposes essentially a you can fascist... You email or just use email on your computer. Stay in. What's that? Sorry? Okay. Uh, imposes essentially a fascist dictatorship. 
uh, between 45 and 40, uh, uh, the Japanese invade, the nationalists retreat, the communists stand and fight, which leaves an impression on the peasants. Finally, uh, 45 to 49, you've got Mao's group. They uh, run a civil war against the nationalists and they win and they found the PRC. Now, why do we call this uh, China crucified? And the answer is the next slide. In China from 1900 to 1949, it's estimated almost 9 million soldiers and civilians were killed. The warlords probably murdered just short of a million people. Uh, in the Sino-Japanese War, which is World War II to us, the estimates run somewhere up to 4 million Chinese killed. The nationalists, on, when they had rule, may have killed as many as two and a half million people. Uh, from the earliest years to their final defeat when they left for Taiwan, the nationalists overall are estimated to have killed probably 10 million Chinese, many of them communists. The Japanese are estimated to have murdered 9 million and as many as, I mean, 3 million, I mean, 4 million, maybe as many as 6 million Chinese. And finally, when Mao takes over, it's estimated they probably killed somewhere between 2 and 12 million people. So if you look at this and try to add it up, which is difficult, you're looking at probably over 50 million people killed in this 50 year period. That is why it's China crucified. We're gonna start off in, uh, with this young man, Joe Rong. He published a tract in 1903 when he was 19 years old. He called for a revolutionary army to wipe out the 5 million barbarian Manchus. Now remember the Qing dynasty was a Manchu dynasty they had conquered uh, the Ming dynasty, which was chi a Chinese dynasty, okay? He described uh, the sacred Han race, descendants of the Yellow Emperor, as the slaves of the Manchus and in danger of extermination. Now, eventually, Sun Yat-sen, who is the father of modern China, <laughs> such as it is, uh, would you know, take these ideas and run with them. This kid died in prison serving a two-year prison term for the track that he published. You can see 9505, he made it to 19 years old when he was killed, when he died. Oh, some music. Who can tell me what that is? You know it? I can't hear it. You can't? Oh. No. Hold on. Just a minute. Let me see. Hold on. Just a second. Something I'm supposed to trip here to make sure that you can hear it. All right. Let's try it again. Let's go back a slide. Uh, the conclusion of the Communist Manifesto reads, the proletarians have nothing to lose, but their chains. They have a, a world to win. Working men of all countries unite. Now, this is kind of an interesting point. In Russia, what were most of the people? Peasants. In China, what were most of the people? Peasants. That's not what Marx wrote about. Marx wrote about the industrialized people who were being taken advantage of. Folks who worked, particularly in England and Germany, in the uh, textile mills, okay? Uh, but it's been dragged to include peasants. The Chinese translation is very interesting. It says, then the world will be for the common people, 
Notice no, none of the stuff that's the factories or anything. And the sounds of happiness will reach the deepest springs. Ah, come, people of every land, how can you not be roused? Now that is the direct Chinese translation in quotes, because it isn't really a translation, of what we have above. The proletarians have nothing to lose. <laughs> so the Chinese obviously have taken it right from the very beginning and bent it to suit Chinese purpose, which is, you know, culturally a rational thing to do. The party was founded in 1906, but not organized to 1911. And uh, <laughs> Chinese had a lot of interesting things. They were drawn, for instance, to anarchy, uh, Bukonin, Kropotkin. Uh, those guys were anarchists from Russia. Uh, and they criticized the entire structure of ideas. They wanted just total change. So you've got the anti-Qing stuff, you've got the communist stuff, you've got anarchy, and you've got folks at the same time who want to form some sort of republic governor, government similar to what we have, democracy, in, in quotes. Sun Yat-sen, father of modern China. He spent most of his life abroad and had no power base, particularly in China. He is revered by both the nationalists and the communists, which is quite a trick. I don't know how he managed this other than the fact that he wanted to make a break from what was there before. He was born in 1866 near Canton. And at age 12, he was sent to live with his brother in Hawaii, where he became a Christian. He received medical training in Hong Kong and he practiced in a short time in Macau before they tossed him because he didn't have a license. <laughs> in 1894, he formed the Revived China Society. And the next year, they staged a plot in Canton, which didn't work. And so he fled to Japan. Japan's an interesting place at this time. Japan is a place in East Asia where folks with ideas for change reside. Japan at this point still has what would be termed a, a constitutional monarchy and still being you know, run in a kind of a normal fashion. The military hasn't taken over yet like they were going to do later in the 30s. Uh, the person who was the biggest influence was a guy by the name of Liang Qichao, who uh, stated basically that China's quite old ways of tolerance and modesty caused China to be shamelessly exploited by foreigners. Now, that's not entirely true, of course, but that's what he said. What he talked about was a need for competition, struggle, determination, and a new nationalism. And so they needed to create a new type of man, kind of a superman. Uh, that has ramifications with uh, Hitler, you know, man and Superman type thing. And uh, of course with Mao, as they create the new, the new person. And you'll see the way you're gonna later become a new person in uh, Mao's PRC is, if you're an intellectual, you're gonna go back out and work in the field because that's where all knowledge resides. Uh, Yan Fu advocated a form of social Darwinism, which is kind of nasty, but that was kind of the vogue at the turn of the century. We had a lot of social Darwinists in the United States, too. And that is where, you know, if you make a lot of money, you do really well, that means you're a good person. Even edged into Christianity, where certain religious groups in our country believed that, uh, and it, is good, it goes all the way back, I guess, to the Puritans, that the good uh, parishioner is the person who uh, is successful in business, has money to donate to the cause. Today we have uh, some sort of, what do they call it? Some sort of prosperity you get if you give so much to certain religious groups. Uh, that, that strange to me. Uh, Sun found himself in an environment where he could promote the cause of the overthrow of the Manchus and founding a republic. Uh, he traveled, he spoke ceaselessly, and he spent most of his time, frankly, in the US, Britain, and around anywhere in the world where he could get money. Uh, he called for revolution, a complete break. All right, so Sun is in Hanoi, and from there he foments a couple more success, unsuccessful uprisings in southern China. And uh, Folks in the Chinese army begin to come to the conclusion that Qing's are finished and it's time to do something. Uh, remember, we got uh, uh, Chirza, uh, the uh, queen mother there, screwing things all around. 
Uh, so he's in Denver on a, on a business trip when the revolution begins. Now, how does the revolution start? Like a lot of revolutions, there's a mistake. A bomb accidentally explodes in the headquarters of a revolutionary group in Wuchang. You wind up with a bunch of army officers who are interested in the cause, who are afraid they're going to be exposed and removed from their positions, or worse. So they telegraph all the provinces, asking them to declare independence from the Qing dynasty. Within six weeks, 15 provinces seceded, which meant the army went that way basically. So the Qings turned to the commander of the Northern Army, Yuan Shikai. Now, you got to see this guy, believe me. But that's not, we're going to get to that. So <coughs> is the father of the Republic. What did he stand for at this point? People's nationalism, which essentially was an anti-Manchu, anti-foreign, anti-imperialism viewpoint. In other words, China wanted to be its own person, so to speak. People's democracy, he wanted an executive, legislature, judiciary, just like we have. But he wanted a couple more things. He wanted some sort of examination of what we're doing ongoing and censorship. Now, the censorship is the part that makes me shake my head slightly, but I'm not going to whitewash what he wanted. Uh, people's livelihood. Now, this is less clear, but it seems like some sort of redistribution to the peasants of land but they don't come out and say it. It sounds a little socialistic, but that's not how he viewed it. Uh, his successor, his son-in-law, Chiang Kai-shek, when he becomes leader, he's unable to distribute the land and relies on the landowners as one of the supports to his party. Cute. So at any rate, he returns from the US and is elected president of the Chinese Republic on January 1st, 1912. Now, he has no power base, and he doesn't control the army, and therefore he really is kind of president of next to nothing. So he offers the presidency to Yuan Shikai, and Shikai says to him, son, I will defend the republic. So on February 14th, Two days after Pui, that's the Qing, last Qing emperor, abdicates, Yuan Shikai becomes president. First thing he does is he moves the government back to Beijing from Nanjing, because that's where his headquarters Northern Army is. <laughs> Makes sense, right? On March 22nd, Song Chia-jian, who worked with uh, Sun Yat's son, is assassinated. And so the party doesn't have its in-China leader anymore. Who assassinated him? Who do you think? You take lots of guesses, but my guess is you're looking at him. Uh, a few months later, Sun Yat-sen and the others who were Kuomintang members, that's the party, they were forced to return to Japan where they would have been arrested. Okay, so what does President Yuan do? First thing he does is he dissolves parliament. Yeah, he's defending the republic, okay. In May, he proclaims a new constitution giving him practically full powers. So what is he essentially? He's a dictator now. He reestablishes the monarchy, which would be nice if it was spelled correctly, but that's something else altogether. Uh, in the second revolution, uh, now, reestablishes, in other words, Puyi is brought back. Puyi actually hasn't gone anywhere. He's been under house arrest, you know, in the palaces in Beijing. But he's, he's now emperor again for a little while. In the second revolution, seven provincial governors attempted to stop Yuan from controlling their provinces. They wanted to retain their control. So he replaces him with his own associates. And what do they immediately do? The same thing. And it's basically the beginning of the warlords. These guys said, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm doing what I want. When World War I started, the Japanese seized the real line uh, that ran up through Manchuria, military bases, and territories, which Germany had held. In January 1915, the Japanese embassy 
uh, presents Yuan with a list of 21 demands, which would essentially make China a protectorate of Japan. He, he had to negotiate, so what did he do? He essentially gave Mongolia, Manchuria, and Shantung. He ceded Japan, the only Chinese industrial em enterprise of any importance, the Han Yaping Company, mm -hmm. together with the blast furnaces for making uh, steel and coal, you know, iron, and iron and coal mines. Then, in 60, he suddenly dies. Now, if you remember looking at him, you can see how he could suddenly die. He didn't look too good. And from then on until 1928, the warlords are going to rule. Now, what I want to show you now is his funeral. It's kind of interesting. It's not, there's no sound, so don't expect any. But they're carrying these big things. But this gives you an idea of the pomp that existed at that time for the flags. And they're walking through with the casket. There's his casket. It's done up very, very nicely. It's done up like, it, it's kind of an overblown version of what a rich Chinese person would have. Uh, something like an emperor for this, for this uh, thing. And with that, there's the train that was taking his casket to where they were gonna bury him. Okay. Move on. The warlord period. Take a look at this map. This is the different uh, allegiances that the, the warlords had. Now, if you take a look, for instance, the one group of warlords under who would be under one commander held uh, Hanan, Shangxi, Suiyuan, part of uh, Ningxi, and all the way up close to Manchuria. Then uh, this is another warlord, and another one, and another one, and another one. So at any rate, you can see how confused this is. There's just loads of warlords, and they're just all over the place. Uh, you can't go from one area to another because you'd have to cross a border, essentially. Uh, so at any rate, it was a mess. And this, is, this goes on from about 1916 through 1926 or so, 27. Sun Yat-sen then gets elected president of Canton. Now the city's its own republic. It's a city state at this point, but he's forced to flee the next year. He's pretty much had it at this point. So he sends his son-in-law, his daughter married uh, Chiang Kai-shek to Moscow to be instructed with the Red Army. This is rather interesting because what is Chiang Kai-shek gonna be most against most of his career? The communists. But he sends his son-in-law to Russia. In 1924, the Kuomintang, the National Party, is reorganized on the Soviet model. What does this tell us? It tells us basically that uh, the democratic type things that Sun had advocated are gone. That they're not part of Chang's uh, agenda. Military academies established where they train in the Russian way. In conjunction with other warlords, he marches into the Yangtze Valley, occupies it, and eventually takes enough of China to declare uh, the nationalist China state in 1927. And what does he do? He moves the capital from Beijing back to Nanjing. Musical capitals. Now, why did he win? Because, as you could see, there was a lack of unity amongst all the other warlords. They had their little areas and they defended them. He worked with the criminal towns who control places like, uh, places like Shanghai, particularly the police of those places. Uh, he was the equal uh, to most of them, and he had a genius for tactics and bargaining. He was a good soldier and a good leader in terms of taking over. Uh, he initiated a one-party system based on the Soviet model. This allowed him to operate a centralized government and gave him absolute control of the civil service and the army. Um, and so he started off with a pretty decent government. And this is a Confucius temple in Nanjing. I just thought you'd like a picture, some pictures of places like Nanjing at that time. 
the regime was different from the warlords in that it was allied closely with the middle class. That's the business sector. It would be the business people. It would also be the landowners. But what they did was they got the folks who were in contact business-wise with the Western powers. And so the Western powers rather quickly recognized them. It was open to Western ideas. Now, that's an interesting thing in terms of weaponry, in terms of you know how to run a fascist type government, you bet they were open to Western ideas. In terms of democracy or communism or any of those things, they're absolutely closed to Western ideas. Most of his officials had been educated and trained in the US or in Europe. And they established the new life movement. This was the big thing in their regime. It's a moral order that takes Confucianism. Now, remember the part of Confucianism where it says you have a moral leader and you're supposed to follow that leader. That's what we're talking about, that Confucian cult. They exalt the founder of the Republic, Chiang, Chiang Kai-shek, and Sun Yat's son. They're raised on a pedestal, just like a Confucian leader would be, uh, like an emperor would be, in fact. They use methods that the Italian fascists, the German Nazis, and the Japanese militaries use. In other words, they eliminate the competition. And they basically scare everybody into being quiet, going along. They even established a thing called the blue shirts. You've heard of the black shirts in Germany? It's the blue shirts in China. And they hunted down both liberals and revolutionaries. Nice bunch. He concentrated on a close, close collaboration with the banking sector, and, and this is the interesting part. There were basically half dozen families, particularly the sons, Chang's other brother-in-law, the Kongs and the Chuns, who basically owned the banks and most of the industry. They nationalized silver, which stabilized the currency. That was, at that time, a good thing. Uh, four state banks dominated the money market. That's it. You want to do business there, you, those were the four banks you dealt with. And their main functions were to finance war expenses because he's continually fighting the entire time he's in. He first starts off fighting the warlords and eventually he's going to be fighting Mao and the communists. And the treasury debt must have really been quite unstable in a sense because they were paying 20 to 40 percent for bonds. When in the United States, I think the the going rate was somewhere between two and four percent at that time. So I mean, obviously someone recognized there were some problems there. And this is the uh, river in Nanjing. From the beginning of the 17th century to the end of the 18th, China had few famines or floods. From the beginning of the 19th century on, the disasters multiplied. And the scale was immense because of the vast numbers of Chinese living along the rivers. I mean, you live where you can grow things, and, and, and that's where you get floods. Uh, there was growth and density of population. Uh, the, the farming was very, very basic. As you can see from here, I mean, they're using water buffalo to pull the, pull the plow to put the uh, rice in. So this is obviously a picture of southern China. Northern China is wheat. Uh, lack of foresight and planning. There were no food reserves. Corrupt administration, very, very corrupt. And, you know, it reminds me of New Orleans. When New Orleans had the dikes burst, levees burst, why did they burst? Because there were corrupt people who had gotten the money to do the repairs on the, on the things and never did them. They pocketed the money. Uh, transformed the slightest climatic disturbances into catastrophes. So despite the, the aim of encouraging agriculture, if you go back to the number of deaths I pointed out from starvation, I think it was a couple million that the Kuomintang were responsible for. This is what it is. And uh, here uh, in Shanxi province, this is someone else's number, 3 million deaths between 28 and 31 from <coughs> starvation. Hmm? From starvation. Yes, question? Someone? Anybody got a question? Okay. 
Okay, the Yangtze River flood of 1931. This is the uh, mother of all floods. As you can see, stuff is coming through. Now, the Yangtze River, if you look at my cursor up on the right, that's the Yangtze River, that's the Yellow River, and then you have the Pearl River that flows into Macau and Hong Kong, okay? Really into Macau. Um, this river is a big deal. And remember we talked last session how Beijing is really not near one of the major rivers, but Nanjing is. Okay, let's look at a little, uh, little bit of the flood. These are some pictures of uh, what occurred during the flood. And uh, you can see it's, this is a levee that's been pierced by the water and the water washes it. Looks just like that's a dead body floating in the water. Uh, you get on your little boat and row to whatever house you're going to. People are standing watching the stuff go down the river. That, that's, these are things in the river. Here's a river that, on a street. It's just the street has become a, a lake. You can see in certain places it really flowed fast. That's rapid water. Someone in the uh, water there. Uh, people trying to get food. This is in uh, Nanjing City. Uh, you know, main streets just flooded out. So, I mean, it was a catastrophic flood in China in 1931. Okay military, uh, they've got a wall up to try to keep the water out, didn't work. There's a uh, station down the end of the block. You can see how high up it is in certain places. It's obviously right along the river. And that's it. This is a political cartoon from the time. And this is a quote, China of the years 1919 to 1945 was a demoralized country which had lost all hope a world in which pity and justice no longer had any meaning, where horror had become a daily event. This is what you're looking at. It's just a terrible, terrible situation. And now we get to the rise of Chairman Mao. This is the nationalists taking care of some communists. <clears throat> Mao was born to a farming family in Hunan. His father built up his holdings and was considered to be a rich peasant. Mao graduated from a teacher's college and then worked in the library of Beijing University. In 1920, Voitinsky, an agent of the Communist International, remember we played the song before, went to Shanghai and set up a new agency for the dissemination of literature. They saw China was ripe for communist uh, rule. Uh, they called for educated youths to go to the countryside to organize peasants, and he returned to Hunan. He was the uh, Hunan delegate to the first meeting in 1921 of the Communist Party in Shanghai, China. In 27-28, uh, where Chiang Kai-shek directed the killings of many labor leaders and organizers, including communists, the communists who survived scattered. Mao led a few thousand men into the mountains along the Hunan-Jiangxi border. And there they formed the Jiangxi Soviet, a government which redistributed land and promoted social programs for peasant families. So from the very beginning in 27-28, Mao is redistributing land to the peasants. A little later, he reports that uh, two million peasants have been organized by the Communist Party into associations. Peasants demanded lowering of rents, and there were sporadic rebellions against the landlords. 32, he was joined by the uh, Central Committee, who fled from Shanghai out to uh, where he was. So now he's got everybody near him, the leadership. Between 28 and 35, the Communist Party kills thousands of its members and purges for perceived betrayals to the nationalists. And of course, they were encouraged to do this by uh, the Russian advisors because Stalin was doing the same darn thing. So at the end of this time, guess who's in charge of the whole thing? Mao. So now we have the, here's Jiangxi Hunan border. This is where they were, right around here. And the long march is this 
monstrous journey, thousands of miles up to the middle of nowhere where they could be safe. Um, they fought the entire trip. They fought the nationalists. They were continually attacked and continually somehow defended themselves and went on. They started off with about 80,000 communist soldiers, cadre, et cetera, and followers. And by the time they got done, let's see, does he say it here? There were 8,000 of them left. 8,000 out of 80,000. Nine out of 10 people who began the long march did not finish the long march. Took a year and they went uh, thousands of miles. Now, I think we should look at something about the long march. So here we go. As the ring tightened, the communists saw that they must break free or die. So in 1934, the Red Army embarked on one of the great feats of history, the Long March. They set off. Soldiers, their women and children, household possessions, the paraphernalia of government, to find safety and time to regroup beyond the reach of the nationalist armies. 90,000 men, women, and children set off on this epic quest. They covered 6,000 miles, as far as from Glasgow to Cape Town. Fought a battle each week, an engagement every two days. Crossed 18 mountain ranges, of which permanent snow covered five, and crossed 24 rivers. Okay, so it's a very, very interesting situation. Here's the march up to here. But take a look at the country at this point. Manchuria in this area is all dominated by the Japanese. Remember the First World War? They had to give them this stuff. They gave it to them. And this is the advances that they make. Japanese as time goes by. Uh, Kwamintung managed to hold this. And, and, and again, they had to piece the country together, chunk of checks. There's now notice there's big parts of China that were never part of this. Sichuan, Qinghai, this is the Muslim area out here, uh, were never part of what was going on. But this is this is essentially what happened when the Japanese begin to move in. So at any rate, there have been peasant uprisings since Chang took power in 28, primarily led by the communists. From 31 to 34, they fought the so uh, Soviet Republic of Ju uh, Juqin in the area south in uh, inland and south of the Yangtze River. I mean, that makes no sense. That's a bad slide. As a result, China ignored the occupation of Northeast China up here. Oh, I see what it is. They, uh, Chang fought the Soviet Republic of Chuechin, which is going to be right around here. Uh, Inner Mongolia, Shanxi, Jehol, Hopei, and Shandong, north of the Huang River, that's up here, Yellow River. Huang is yellow in Chinese. Uh, these provinces provide the Japanese with resources, so the Japanese are moving down. Chang considered the loss of these provinces inevitable. Their warlords had relationships with the Japanese in Manchuria and Korea, and he simply lacked sufficient troops to fight both communists and Japanese. Japanese occupation of Beijing. This, this occurred reasonably early. Uh, they witnessed the national forces, which withdrew in the face of the Japanese advance. They contrasted that with the communist peasant militia who kept fighting the Japanese. Now, let me ask you something. You're out on a farm. Uh, you know, you're a peasant on a farm. The nationalists leave and the communists stay and try to fight so you can keep your land. Who are you going to be more interested in supporting? Uh, at any rate, this is, this is taking over in Beijing. More news from the East. Worse even than a military defeat, the most serious blow to China's moral prestige 
is the occupation of her ancient capital by Japan's armies. Yet such is the compelling power of advancing troops that Peking citizens actually cheer. Okay. I have no idea what they, I have no idea what they cheered for. All right, so Mao, with the purges and everything, eliminates his competition for leadership by having the Central Committee label him as deviationists of the left or right, opportunists or adventurers. So the rest of the Central Committee is remolded into cronies of Mao. People learn to interpret any deviation from Mao's line as a defect in their thinking due to subjectivism, liberalism, characteristics of their bourgeoisie background. Hmm. Uh, a couple of party strategists wind up being publicly humiliated. And this is one of those type of things. Nice thing to be the person who's that one. Uh, in the end, everybody either adopts his, uh, Mao's collective consciousness and teachings, or they learn to be careful what they say. In Shanxi, he completes his most famous writings. Now, if you can, you see the little picture of me. I am holding up. Can you see that or not? Am I on your group with everybody else? Yes. That's it's a little red book. Uh, I bought it when I worked in Hong Kong, and it's it's really interesting because it's in the beginning. For all of us, it's got pictures of the chairman. See, there he is. And if we adhere to his thoughts, we'll be in good shape. And then it's literally, let's see. Ooh, about 560 pages of Mao thought that everybody carried eventually. Uh, converted the Marxist-Leninist urban emphasis to apply to peasant farmers. Glorified the peasants as the true masses. The theory of uh, mass line, party cadres had to go along with the peasant masses and could learn from them before they became leaders. Everyone in Yan'an had to study Mao's writings in small study groups, and they acquired a vocabulary and concepts that would unite them and strengthen their sense of purpose. In other words, they learned uh, kami speak, so to speak. Okay. The Japanese invasion provided a perfect opportunity for Mao to build a broad base of popular support. In North China, where the Japanese armies penetrated, peasants were ready to mobilize, and the communists were there to lead them. They hated the Japanese for seizing women for prostitution, men for forced labor, and especially for the three all policy, which was the Japanese would kill all, burn all, loot all. Nasty stuff. You get to Nanjing, they do that. As the Japanese were primarily occupying cities, towns, and rail lines, there's plenty of room to hide in the countryside and conduct guerrilla operations. And I uh, will end this part with this movie. I think you'll find it interesting. This is The Rape of Nanking or Nanjing. Extensive documents have shown that during the Japanese army's 14-year occupation, China witnessed some of the worst crimes against humanity in history. The Nanjing Massacre is certainly one of them. War started in 1931 when the Imperial Japanese government invaded Manchuria and occupied vast lands in the Northeast, which are now China's Heilongjiang, Jilin, in the Aoning provinces. Some 45 million casualties were recorded. Most took place during the last eight years of the war as a direct result of a Japanese war policy known as blunder, kill, and burn. The policy was fully put to use on December 13, 1937, when the Japanese army seized the city of Nanjing, the then capital of the Republic of China. The Chiang Kai-shek government had decided to make a strategic retreat a few days before. Nanjing was left wide open for what later became one of the most atrocious war crimes in human history. According to the final ruling of the Nanjing War Crimes Tribunal in 1947, more than 300,000 people were massacred in the span of six weeks. Over 200,000 women were raped, tortured, and killed. Thousands more were forced to become sex slaves to the Japanese army. The Japanese government to this day has yet to make an official apology to the families of the victims, despite the fact that dozens of mass graves have been discovered over the decades. 
1998, the remains of 208 people were recovered from a mass grave of only 40 cubic meters. The site is now open to the public in the Memorial Hall of the Nanjing Massacre. Apart from its crimes in Nanjing, the Imperial Japanese Army was also held responsible by the international community for a dozen other massacres across China, as well as conducting biological warfare experiments on human beings, using chemical weapons, and forcing women into sex slavery. In 2014, the Chinese government designated December 13th, the day Nanjing fell, as a National Memorial Day. Now, the thing to remember here is, if you look at the total numbers, the Chinese killed more Chinese than the Japanese did. The nationalists, the communists. So at any rate, I think this is a good point to take a break. Uh, I'll see you again in about five minutes. Thank you. <sighs> Does anyone have any questions? Uh, you can unmute and ask if you got anything. I say, as you folks come back, if anybody's got any questions, I'd be happy to try to deal with them, you know, either about this or about what's going on right now. Hong Kong, the rest of it, it's very interesting. Tom, was, uh, was China uh, still primarily agricultural at this point, or were they heavily industrialized? No, very agricultural. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, that's, that, that's, I think, one of the really interesting aspects, both Russia and China. Both countries became, you know, fervent communists, and yet they didn't have that type of factory proletariat that Marx had envisioned originally. Right. So instead of becoming uh, what Marx had probably envisioned, more along a socialist type line, they became, you know, these dictatorships. Uh, I guess it's not surprising, and it, it, you know, you look at a country like China, um, they have no history of any kind of democratic uh, regime. Uh, you know, they go through all these emperors, then they go through uh, Yuan Shaoqir, and then, you know, you get into uh, the warlords, Chiang Kai-shek and Mao. They've never had a government where they could have any input. They're always on the receiving. So the reason the Confucius stuff kind of worked well, because it made it a little easier for them psychologically to accept that whatever the government does, I guess I'll have to do it. Really no choice for the most of the masses. It, you know, it's not a country like here where the, the predominant part of the country's middle class, they're the predominant part of the country were peasants. Yeah. And you know, subsistence farming. I mean, if they didn't have a crop, they starved, literally. And they did start in the 30s. So. Yeah, when I was reading the article you sent, I was thinking about legalism that you <laughs> were talking about. It's like, yeah, well, we'll just 
make the laws and write them up and enforce them. One of the things you do when you work for a living, trying to analyze what's going on, which I did to a degree, uh, certainly not like the, you know, the analysts at the CIA or DIA or whatever, but I mean, we had to know kind of how folks thought in order to interview them properly. Uh, is you, 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 you needed to know that, you know, these, these philosophical and historical precedents, the, the, to, you need to know how the society was knit together because a lot of times the answers you'd get, the only way you could actually get to something that was worthwhile was to try to, you know, ferret your way into it, trying to empathize in a sense almost with how the person felt in order to get them to talk to you. Sure. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's start up again. Uh, Mao Zedong. The guerrillas who were fighting the Japanese with them were not all communists, uh, but the communists were very, very interested in gaining control of social, economic, and political life in these rural villages. And so where these other folks would be there to fight, in most cases, they kind of shrug and go, well, I don't want to have to do all that other extra stuff. The communists did it. And they did it uh, all the time. Uh, they were friendly troops. They didn't steal from the peasants' crops, but rather they helped them bring in the harvest. You contrast that with the nationalists who took whatever they needed. And again, you can't imagine the peasants supporting the nationalists over the communists, because communists actually treated them with a certain amount of respect. Uh, they redistributed land, uh, and they used a graduated tax that encouraged the larger landowners to sell to peasants in the areas they control. In other words, they made it too expensive to own big tracts of land, but almost not expensive at all to own a little patch that you and your family could farm. Uh, they taught them to sing stirring patriotic songs, not the internationality that I played for you. That, that's European. They had their own songs. Uh, under the nationalists, too many taxes. Under the communists, too many meetings. That was what a lot of the peasants would say, but they, they could deal with the meetings. They a lot of times had no money to pay the taxes. Uh, they were indoctrinated so they could build a better, more egalitarian future by working together and following the lead of the party. Doesn't that sound nice? Mm. It isn't, actually. Okay. Let's look at another view. China's greatest and richest city is still ringed by a wall of fire. Bombs and shells still fall on the international settlement. British troops have been killed. Death ravages the Chinese city of Shapai, as Japan's Rear Admiral Okoshi, leader of the Marines, defends his lines against the Chinese brigades that have sworn to die fighting sooner than retire. From her firmly entrenched positions, Japan swoops out on sudden raids, often to be driven back again. And from the battlefields of the air, warplanes crash to destruction. China's more than a half million square miles, Japan's armies now occupy nearly three quarters of a million as her war machine spurs forward, devouring mile after mile in the Far East War of the Century. By the way, I did try to license those films, and it was absolutely impenetrable <laughs> to try to do it. So I just said, to heck with it. So you'll see the little flash ups on, the, on those Pathé films because pff, I didn't license them. All right, in 1937, the Kuomintang government withdrew from Chongqing to Sichuan. That's way out, Western China. Chang was now suddenly deprived of his resources. He didn't have his revenue, his taxes, or his custom duties because those areas were occupied by the Japanese, Shanghai and all, uh, Nanjing. It was also cut off the main uh, support in Shanghai, uh, bankers and such. The Kuomintang was now entirely dependent on international aid. This is when they started flying the hump from India over the uh, Himalayan mountains into Sichuan to supply them. And he got aid from Russia, the US, Britain, and France. Why Russia? Because Russia was against Japan this point. They had uh, turned on the Nazis in Germany when the Nazis invaded them and uh, become an ally. Hence, you have Tuscanini in the beginning 
conducting the internationality in the middle of a piece that has a bunch of national anthems in it. They stuck this in in addition so that they'd make the Russians happy. Uh, by 1944, the Chinese dollar depreciated to one five hundredth of its previous war pre-war value. This is the old deal, similar to what you see in Germany after the First World War, where people are literally walking with wheelbarrows full of money to buy, you know, the loaf of bread. Poverty spread even to the members of the former privileged classes. Everybody's getting disaffected. Okay. Most of the world seems to have forgotten that there's still a war in the East, but not the Chinese. They know well that when they see Japanese troops on the horizon, they must fear the approach of death. That when they hear the distant boom of bombardment and the roar of warplanes overhead, that destruction and horror are again sweeping towards them. for so long, it has almost become part of the life of the people. But time cannot efface its horrors. And until war and the danger of war are removed from the earth, there will be no real progress in the East or in the West. Okay, so we get to 1945 and the Japanese surrender. That's after we uh, put nuclear, bombed them twice. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Chiang immediately uh, recaptured most of the territories that had been occupied by the Japanese, including Nanjing. They decided that all remained was for him to be rid of the communist bandits. So uh, they take the offensive in Northeast China and uh, they lose. The Red Army uh, beats them. Uh, at first they fell back and then they formed their own offensive. Uh, 300,000 troops surrendered in 48. Second Great Battle occurred on the Huai River Basin. Now, this is the awful one. Communists won the battle and over a half a million men died that day in December 1948. Talk about battles. I, I don't know that the U.S. has ever been in a battle that really even begins to approach a half a million people dying in one day, in a couple of days. Throughout 49, the major cities fell and uh, Chang and his government fled to Taiwan. Now, the picture on the right is uh, the only one like it. And this is Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong together. Needless to say, it was before the nationalists decided to go after the communists who then took them out. In the spring of 1947, the communists exploded in a series of quick offensives which left the nationalist garrisons in Manchuria dazed and confused. The Red Army swept town after town under its control until only three major cities in Manchuria remained in nationalist hands. In June, the communists swept into North China in a counteroffensive which neither the nationalists nor their American advisers had believed possible. Chiang's armies struggled vainly to halt it. Their front line, such as it was, disintegrated. By the end of 1947, red troops had reached the Yellow River, and the red tide had engulfed much of northern and central China. Mao Zedong declared, the Chinese People's Revolutionary War has now reached a turning point. Red morale was high, well-clad, well-fed, and well-led. Their soldiers' discipline was good, and above all, they knew what they were fighting for. Okay. This Chinese Civil War is an interesting thing. Now let me just see something there. Hold on. Let's look at this one too, because it's kind of interesting also. I like this old footage because it's... it's In the cities, people's lives had not improved after the war. Massive economic problems were undercutting Jiang's support. The government's financial policies were chaotic. This is the wheelbarrow full of money. The homeless and starving filled city streets. 
black market trading and corruption were widespread. To make matters worse, in 1947, floods in the south destroyed the rice crop. And in the north, there was a devastating famine. In response, the United Nations Relief Agency sent millions of dollars in aid. America continued to send vast quantities of war surplus and millions more dollars to help Jiang in his struggle against the communists. Many were certain that Jiang's family was embezzling huge amounts of this aid. He and his wife continued to ask for more. In 1947, President Truman sent Albert Wedemeyer back to China to assess the situation. Although it was clear that Jiang's government was corrupt and losing support, for America there was no alternative. Wedemeyer urged Jiang to effect immediate, drastic political and economic reforms. At the same time, he recommended more U.S. aid. But American aid could not win the war for Jiang. He made the crucial mistake of overextending his forces in the north. The communists responded with a change in tactics. They mounted a major offensive against the nationalist armies in the cities. The change of tactics worked. By November 1948, after only a month and a half, the communists won control of North China. With North China under communist control, the battle for central China began. The nationalists failed because we completely lost the people's support. I had heard that during the northern expedition, the people gave us flowers and food. During the war against Japan, the people provided intelligence and helped us resist the Japanese. Once the civil war started, we couldn't find anyone to give us even road directions. There is a saying in China, the water that carries the boat can also overturn it. On January 21st, 1949, 11 days after the battle for central China, Chiang Kai-shek resigned. In Shanghai, people were leaving in droves. Chiang Kai-shek and his government retreated to the island of Taiwan. It was carefully planned. They took a huge part of China's art treasures and all of the central bank reserves. U.S. aid followed. The war continued without Chiang Kai-shek. The communists prepared to cross the Yangtze River, heading for Nanking and Shanghai. They quickly overcame nationalist defenses. With the communists just outside Shanghai, the remaining nationalist police stepped up their anti-communist activities. Mr. Squeamish, turn your head. On October 1st, 1949, we listened to the radio. We heard the ceremony of the founding of the People's Republic of China. 
Chairman Mao proclaimed that the Chinese people had stood up. All of us were overjoyed. We jumped around. We were really proud and happy. So how were the communists able to take over so easily? It should be pretty apparent at this point. I mean, there was war weariness in the country. First you get the boxers, then you get the warlords, then you get the nationals, corrupt, who cracked down on liberals and the intelligentsia who failed to gain or keep the support of the population. They'd let the people starve out on the farms during the famines. Then you get the Japanese coming in and finally you have the Civil War. So, I mean, it was just, it was just a terrible mess. Uh, and, and that doesn't even begin to talk about the floods and famines and all those other things that occurred. So it was a very, very bad mess. Uh, People's Liberation Army showed discipline and helpfulness to peasants. Soldiers were instructed to say please and thank you, and in fact were uh, uh, disciplined if they didn't. They paid for supplies taken, and uh, they didn't even, uh, as, as they were told, you're not even allowed to take a needle from a civilian home. Uh, obviously, in the beginning, they took a soft line on the property classes, with certain exceptions, where land reform was, you know, concerned. And they made glowing promises about a new day of benefits with the coming of communism. There was a similarity between the uh, new communist doctrine and the old Confucian order. There was a uh, state orthodoxy, uh, which is something the Confucians also had. You had the leader and you had the people below and each knew their place. Experts were put in guard, uh, place to guard and administer the country according to these rules. It was a duty of the, of the rule to obey and within the allowed framework. Uh, the common people in China had seen a decline in capitalism as practiced by the corrupt nationalists. It didn't work. And the currency went you know, to one five hundredth of what it had been before the war. Uh, in Japan, uh, they'd seen the uh, self-defeating nature of imperialism not to mention, you know, the countries like Britain, who had been beat by the Japanese uh, and, and had to turn over the, the areas in China that they, that they held to the uh, Japanese. And finally, communism appealed to the messianic needs of the population. That is, essentially, it took the place of religion. You know, remember, these were Buddhists at this point. Land reform. As the revolutionary program began, the peasants were the first to benefit. They were granted the land reform they'd wanted for so long. It was the party's plan that they should seem to make the change themselves. Speak bitterness meetings were held in which the landlords and others linked to the defeated nationalists were confronted and denounced by the peasants. We were told to get together and ask the landlords to return land to us. We stated how much they should return and how they should return it. There was a denunciation meeting every day. Local party secretary, Lua Shifa, helped whip up feeling in his village. The first thing we had to do was to bring down the landlords. What we did was persuade the tenant farmers to denounce them. At the public meeting, they would explain how they couldn't afford to pay back the rent every year, or how they had to take out high interest loans to pay it off. People around the stage sympathize with the poor peasant stories, and they'd weep. 
府接受了群众的要求，判决罪犯李世仁的死刑。坚决与人民为敌的反革命分子，一定受到人民严厉的制裁。Hundreds of thousands were killed. Okay. Okay. So now the Bao government is there. Forty-nine, they've taken over. By fifty-one, they have the whole country, and they come up with the three anti campaign that was intended to eliminate corruption, waste, and bureaucracy. It didn't. Five. The five anti followed, and that expo exposed businessmen and bourgeoisie bribery. Tax defaulting, stealing state property, cheating in all forms, and benefiting、uh, by the state's economic secrets, gave the government a large degree, degree of control over the private businesses, which was the real purpose, and established standards of public honesty, which supposedly distinguished the PRC from its predecessors. Well, I don't know.、Uh, the thing on the right, this picture on the right, is a picture that appeared a little later during the famines. And so people are starving under the communist government. And what do they show? A cornucopia of plenty, in a sense. All right, persuasion Chinese style. Self-criticism in small groups was、uh, the way everything went. You'd cut a person off from their family if they were suspected of not adhering to party policy, or they weren't, you know, peasants. You remove them from familiar surroundings, force them to read and memorize texts such as Liao Shaoqi's "How to Be a Good Communist." You compel them to work hard for long hours so that fatigue, tension, and uncertainty rise, and you instill a lurking threat of being sent away to a labor battalion, and you subject them to extreme language, both for praise and for blame. It's essentially brainwashing. Friend and foe are distinguished solely. Upon the basis of class, good people are peasants; bad people are everybody else. Anyone could become one of the people by a change of heart, and of course, only the people—that's the peasants—had rights. Life was serious, and humor was considered decadent. Romantic love was a mark of bourgeoisie mentality. Hmm. Confessions were written, rewritten, and recited before the group. Feelings of shame, guilt, and faith were used as a part of this brainwashing. Ni、uh, shi nao, and silence was no defense. Everyone, sooner or later, had to participate. You couldn't stand there and refuse to testify. You had to.、Uh, silence was. Oh, sorry. When the confession was finally accepted, the individual felt, of course, enormous relief and cleansing. Yeah, he wasn't being hounded all the time, but that's neither here nor there. Now they were liberated to the communist way of life. And certain of the place.、Mm. There you got it. That's how you do it.、Uh, same way you break somebody down.、Uh, well, so now we go to Tibet. In 1950, if you remember the old Qing map, the Qings had kind of dominated Tibet. Mao decided Tibet ought to be part of China because historically it was part of China for a short while in the Qing dynasty. So they invaded in 1950. The protest、uh, from the Tibetans was liberation from whom and from what. Ours is a happy country with a solvent government. <laughs> Not for long. The UN took no action, nor did Britain or India. In 21 battles, 10,000 Tibetans were killed. The Chinese occupied the key points in the country. Within a year, in 59, Tibetans attempted to rebel. The PLA killed 87,000 Tibetans. The Dalai Lama fled to India. It's the reason we see him now and again because he's in the West.、Uh, even though he's not the West, but I mean he's he comes out here all the time.、Uh, the basis was the Qing Dynasty control of Tibet.
We're not going to. Everything was planned by Mao Zedong as early as 1949. Following the then recent victory of the Communist Revolution, Mao revived China's old imperial ambitions to impose its sovereignty on Tibet. He was not concerned by historical realities or that the country had been governed for centuries by the Dalai Lamas. The first phase of the Maoist initiative was simple, to force the Tibetan authorities to admit that the Chinese forces marching upon their country were not an army of conquerors, but an army of liberation from Western imperialism. When the Chinese army enter 1950 in the Tibetan area under the Dalai Lama's government's jurisdiction, the Chinese army already crushed around seven to 8,000 Tibetan soldiers. Tibetan army, all crushed. So then the Chinese army can go up to Lhasa without any resistance. But then the Chinese leadership, they stop the Chinese army on eastern part of autonomous of Tibet, the Chamdu area, stop there, then the discussion about agreement is started. Uh, although that agreement, according uh, sort of expert, that also is an agreement signed under Duris. Your arrest. When the 17-point agreement was signed on May 17, 1951, Tibet lost Amdo, the Dalai Lama's native province, and Kham, which were both annexed by the Chinese. Reduced to its western portion, Tibet retained an autonomous government and its social and religious traditions. A minor concession for Mao, who'd obtained what he wanted, Tibet was declared liberated and not annexed to show that it had always been Chinese. From this point on... All right, it suffices to say they later, with the 59 rebellion, took the whole thing. And there have been any number of uprisings in Tibet over the years. And uh, right now, uh, the standing joke in Tibet is that in every corner, and in the middle of every block, there's a camera. And everybody who does anything in Tibet is looked at on the cameras. It's an absolute horrible thing. Now, where's another place where they wanted to invade? Taiwan. They considered Taiwan part of China. That's where Chiang Kai-shek had gone. Uh, they tried several times to take Taiwan, okay? And uh, this was the analysis of the general who was supposed to take it the first time in 1950. Liberation of the islands, especially Taiwan, is an extremely big problem and will involve the biggest campaign in the history of modern Chinese warfare. They have built strong defensive works. Needless to say, that invasion hasn't occurred yet. This is kind of interesting. It's from the top. This is the Momentous Kuwait talks Island. between Secretary of State Dulles and Chinese Nationalist President Chiang Kai-shek. As a result of this Formosa meeting, Chiang rules out force as the main highway back to the mainland. He says that the key to the recovery of China is in the minds and hearts of the Chinese people. At the same time, the top-level talks iron out U.S. and nationalist policy on the disputed offshore islands. As Dulles flew to Formosa, the Chinese Reds resumed their bombardment of Kamoi, and the nationalists redouble their efforts to fortify the strategic island group. The shells on Formosa are destined for the Kamoi group. These are the first Defense Department films of Little Kamoi. Kamoi's little neighbor that has taken a big pounding from communist shore batteries. The Dulles Chang Agreement has moved a step closer toward committing the U.S. to defend the offshore islands if the Reds should follow up these incoming shells with invading troops. In this case, the communist bombardment fails to head off or disrupt a nationalist airdrop. This takes place on the main base of Kamoi. The leaguered, challenged, reinforced, Kamoi figures as the key part in the east-west political puzzle. 
sure it does. Now, this is a little kamoi, <laughs> or actually this is Shuyu. This is communist China behind it. And this island is nationalist Chinese right out in the harbor, which is really interesting. This is a huge auditorium that the military constructed in uh, on Taiwan, or no, I'm sorry, in Kamoi. And uh, the, again, these are islands three miles off the coast of China, the rest of them. And uh, they could uh, withstand bombings in this building because it's under the mountain. These are the uh, anti-tank barriers out on the islands from way back then. I don't think they'd stop much now. They're kind of rusted. But uh, you can see that uh, this woman is collecting oysters right by them. Uh, it's half hour ferry ride from China. Come on. And it's being done now. Incidentally. All right. And the last major thing we're going to talk about today, Korea. In, uh, on June 15, 1950, North Koreans invaded South Korea. Uh, this was a result of an ongoing war between South and North Korea and, uh, and North, I'm sorry, let me start again. North Korean troops invaded South Korea, I beg your pardon, the other thing comes later. Russia uh, was boycotting the UN General Assembly, I mean UN uh, Security Council at that time. That's the only reason they managed to get a UN force into South Korea, because the Russians would have vetoed it. First, the Chinese didn't participate uh, and the Russians were the suppliers for uh, Kim Il-sung of North Korea. As UN troops began to push the North Koreans back, Zhou Enlai, that's, he's the fellow who ran the foreign ministry, who was really the de facto number two behind Mao for years and years, stated, the barbarous action of American imperialism and its hanger on in invading Korea not only menaces peace in Asia, in the world, but in general, but seriously threatens the security of China in particular. That's the important phrase, security of China in particular. North Korea's enemy is our enemy. North Korea's defense is our defense. That's very nice. That part of the phrase I recited explains what comes next. But there's just a couple. You've heard of the uh, Chosun Reservoir? Well, that's the area around it. I just thought it'd be nice to show you a picture of it because you always hear of that when you talk of the Korean War. You've seen the TV show MASH. Well, that's what one of the uh, helicopters actually looked like. They weren't modern helicopters with a couple things strapped on. They were 1950 version helicopters. Uh, Cho and Lai warned that if UN forces invaded North Korea, the 38th parallel, which is right there, uh, PLA would stop them. And in fact, that's what occurred. Uh, MacArthur pushed, some say too far, some say not far enough. Uh, and uh, as they were pushing toward the Yalu River, which is the border between Korea and China, uh, the Chinese came across and they drove us all the way down and almost out of the country. Uh, our intelligence failed to detect that was going to occur, which was a major, major mistake. Uh, they eventually committed 700,000 troops to the Korean Peninsula. And I'm going to skip that because it's ready to begin. I brought the Yalu that is because we don't have time. The conflict continued until the truce was signed in 1953. The casualties that we know of 160,000 U.S. troops, 400,000 South Koreans, and 600,000 North Korean troops. Chinese lost even more between 700,000 and 900,000 troops. Chinese figures haven't been released because they didn't consider them People's Liberation Army. They all went into North Korea as volunteers. So they weren't officially in the army. <clears throat> China hailed the ceasefire as a victory. It kept its buffer. It wasn't gonna let US essentially border it. And that's the reason they came in when we approached the Yalu River and they got it back to the 38th parallel. Uh, it, re it reinforced the Chinese perceptions of the evils of Western imperialism because we came in and helped South Korea. And they played that up quite a bit and isolated the US's 
the main enemy of China. Westerners who stayed in China were forced to leave, including many missionaries, some of whom were arrested and charged with being spies. The human wave tactics the Chinese use reinforced our Western stereotypes of the Asian contempt for uh, life. Uh, revulsion and fear of the Chinese were heightened when it was revealed that the Chinese and North Koreans had attempted to brainwash Americans. Uh, you know, the movie, the famous movie, uh, The Manchurian Candidate, comes from that, with Frank Sinatra. And then uh, peace talks uh, that stalled for two years due to Chinese demand that all Chinese prisoners be returned. The problem was, and this is a funny one, 14,000 of the Chinese prisoners didn't want to go back. And a lot of them wound up going to Taiwan. Go figure. They, they didn't love the workers' paradise. All right. Next week, whoop, we're going to start with the Great Leap Forward. And uh, <laughs> that's a real interesting one. See the ground there? Uh, they're clearing it. <laughs> All right. Are there any questions? Uh, next week, we're going to do the Great Leap Forward to the present day. Yes, anything? Question. Yeah. Where did the thought control, where did those ideas come from that didn't seem to be something that was brought in from the Soviet Union at the time? Was that something that developed over the long time of the long march and, and all the other wars? Yeah. I think that's a pretty safe proposition. I think that that's, you know, there's geniuses that are good and geniuses that are bad. And I, I consider Mao kind of a bad genius from our point of view. Probably that, you know, that I went and described the mind control stuff that they did. That was probably the smartest single thing that he did because it, it lined every, it, first of all, it worked with the Confucius thought process. It worked with legalism. Uh, it basically set up a, a, a procedure where you did things a certain way and uh, leaders led, followers followed. Yeah. Any others? Was, was the denunciation uh, a part of uh, Confucianism? The denouncing of the uh, leaders yeah. of the town? The I, old... I think you can say yes, in the sense that the landlords were supposedly greedy and kept the people very, very poor, and therefore they were not moral rulers. So if you look at Confucianism, uh, it's up to everyone to be moral all the way from the top to the bottom. And uh, from the viewpoint of the peasants, the landowners were not moral because they were forcing them to take out these high interest loans and such. Uh, and, and a real moral person would, would sympathize with them and help them, not put them down. So yes, I would say that fits. Thank you. Yeah. yeah and, and in the grand scheme of things, this is Penny Young here. Okay. If you look at the huge, <laughs> if you can look at a huge vision of whatever goes on and in a cyclical sense, if you look at what China was before, Ma, even when Sun Yat-sen and the whole group there who were there before he was with the Nationalist Party, he had, the peasants needed somebody to represent them and he was there. And um, so in a sense, it was almost as if the country needed somebody like that. I'm not saying that he's, you know, he was good in every sense of the word, but when you look at the evolution of things, and if you see it in a cyclical rather than a linear way, then you're going to see how something like Mao Zedong had to, had to happen almost. Well, um, if, you look, if you look at the cycles, the Ming went down and the Qing went down and the nationalists went right. down. And, and, and in each case, it's almost as if the organism had, you know, blossomed and then decayed. Right. It gets to a certain point of decay, something's got to fill a void. Right. And I think Mao realized that nationalists, he, he could see what was happening. Nationalists were doing nothing to take care of the, you know, 95% of the people who were peasants. And he decided, okay, it may take a lot of peasants to win a battle, but uh, we're going to, get those peasants on our side. And, and they started all the way back in the 1920s. 
had literally prepped for 20 something years before they actually were able to take over. And uh, yeah, I, I think it was, like I said, I think the guy was a genius. Oh, absolutely. He had to have been because, uh, I mean, who, out, who else was looking out for the peasants? Yeah. Certainly nobody but, else. Uh, but but anybody, understand you know. by those same standards, Stalin and Hitler were geniuses. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. We can't dismiss that whole, you know, the other perspective of the communism and so on. I mean, communism is a dirty word, but Jesus was a socialist. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, 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 I uh, I've never thought of it that way, but I suppose you could look at it that way. Look, everything is a result of what's come before. When you, you, you know, the first one I did the philosophy lecture, it, you have to understand all these things, certain philosophies define societies. It's, it's, they're really the result of how the societies live, and that defines how they think. And that's the reason you get. You, you go to an amusement park and you'll see the little Asian kids being told, be quiet, and they immediately are quiet. Then you see, trying to tell American kid that. The kid looks and says, why? Or like, you know what? Uh, it's this, these things are, are, are inculcated from the time people are little. And the Chinese basically have been inculcated in, you know, this Confucianism, and it, it basically transcends everything. And that is, you gotta have a moral leader. Well. We haven't seen many moral leaders as we looked at the, you know, two dynasties, a nationalist and a communist, but that's what it's supposed to be. But the, the citizens part of it is to obey. And they do, for the most part. Most people get along. What choice do they have? Somebody asking something, or is that just something that they don't have, they're not muted. Any other questions? All right, next time, great leap forward all the way through to the present day with the emphasis on uh, how uh, the three leaders that really matter, Mao, Deng Xiaoping, and Xi, the present president, premier, secretary of the Communist Party, head of the military, how they accumulate power so that they have total control over everything that occurs because that's what so works. Does babysitting count? That's the first Baby. time I earned money. And huh. I used a Blackberry pick at three cents a pound at the farm next door. And I was a star Blackberry pick. Mary, and we can hear you. Great lecture, Tom. Uh, hold on just one second. Let me uh, mute that. Up. There we go. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoy doing these. Uh, I hope that. Uh, you gained something useful from it. Oh, it's been very, very excellent. Thank you so much. This is a great class. I've, I've needed this on China. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Hopefully by the time we get done next time, uh, you'll be able to look at uh, President Xi and understand how and why he's doing what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And how mm -hmm. it makes abundant sense. Uh, as you look at what's happening right now, for instance, in Hong Kong, uh, realize that they have been setting this up for a while, just like Mao did. And now that we have a pandemic on our hands, this is when they're going to clamp on, on Hong Kong. It makes abundant sense. Uh, and it is what happens when you have leaders that plan ahead versus <laughs> leaders uh, in the West who, in terms of time span, span in planning at least, are impulsive and short term. And so what you're looking at is something that they have obviously been waiting for the right time to do. And now is the right time, in their opinion. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Thank, Thank you. you. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Aha. Uh -huh. Sean Connery. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. See you guys. Bye bye. You're welcome. Bye. bye. Thanks. You're welcome. All righty. Uh, somehow here we turn it off. I don't know how. Oh, well, we'll get there.